Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my talk about Lambda Captures. Uh, this is my fifth time at meeting C++ in Berlin. Actually, the first, fourth time I am presenting here. The third time the talk is about Lambdas. Uh, the second time I have the privilege to do it with live audience, because the two last times were obviously online. And actually, the first time I really prepared for it, so hopefully it goes well. I, I mean, prepared, as in prepared the timing, so I don't go over time. Uh, and before I start, I have a confession to make. When I submitted the talk, or the abstract for this talk, I didn't have high hopes of it ever, ever getting accepted. I mean, we are talking about Lambda captures, right? If you list like five most boring and uninspiring topics in C++, Lambda captures will be there. You are guaranteed to have there. Uh, but I made an estimation error. The talk got accepted, and it was well received. So on one day, I sat at my desk with the idea that I have to start preparing the talk. And it occurred to me that I got myself into trouble. We are still at the topic of Lambda captures. I mean, after five slides, you are done, right? There is nothing more there. And I had to fill the whole hour with it. I met an estimation error again. I had to cut down the material and cut aggressively to fit it into one hour. So with that being said, let's start the real talk. When I was doing the research for it and preparing it, I came up with a set of rules. And if you follow those rules, you will be a happy capturer. The first one, and the most important one, is that capturing is mostly about lifetime. And I mean mostly, not always. I will show you why it's mostly. Or to put it in other words, it's about making sure that the things that you use within your lambdas are within their lifetime. If you need an example, that's an example. And this is a recurring example. You will see it a lot of, lots of time. It's a simple function. The only purpose of this function is to add a record to some key value stores or to a database. Uh, but it adds this record in a peculiar way. It generates the key automatically, so the function generates the key, and it updates the data store using the key and the record provided by the user. And now we have a problem. How does the user know of this function what the key was? How can he retrieve back the data he stored in the database, right? There is no way to do it. Now you have two options here. Either you return the key back to the user, or you return the lambda. And this is the case when I decided to return a lambda. It's beautiful, right? You return a lambda, in, in, uh, encapsulates the behavior of retrieving. It hides actually the nasty details of a key. That's how we should code. That's how it should be done. We are absolutely safe. There is a capture default by copy. It means that everything this lambda needs should be copied into the lambda. No issues, no problems whatsoever. You test the code, and you get this. That's a lifetime issue. That's one of the many lifetime issues that happen when you use Lambda captures. Now, before we really start talking about the captures, we have to talk about what Lambdas really are. This is almost the simplest Lambda, right? A Lambda, it's a square brackets, followed by a parenthesis, followed by braces. That's simply put a Lambda. The middle part is optional, and there are lots of other things you could put there, but we focus on the basics. A simple lambda can just take an integer and return an integer, like in this case. It doesn't yet capture anything. It doesn't need to capture anything. We'll come back to captures in a moment. When a compiler sees a lambda like this, it does a kind of magic transformation under the hood that's known to some of you, and some of you it is not known yet. The compiler doesn't see a lambda. The compiler sees like a shorthand for a function object, and it generates a function object under the hood for you. With a name, a name that you don't know, you don't have an access to this name, but this function object has one crucial feature. It has a publicly accessible function call operator with exactly the same parameter list as your lambda and exactly the same body as your lambda. And this function call operator is what is getting called when you later on invoke your lambda. So your lambda is not really a lambda. It's an object of some class type that's known as a closure type. Now, we don't have yet 
a capture. So let's introduce a capture. Imagine that instead of adding 42, you would like to have a 42 as an externally defined variable. And you would like to use this variable within the lambda. Like, so replace all the 42s with a K. Is it possible? Definitely it's possible. Now, to put more context to it, let's say that all of this, both the lambda and our variable, are within a function. So they are local to a function that are variables with automatic storage duration. Such a variable needs to be captured. That's the only way you can actually have this K within the lambda, so within your closure type. It's the only way your closure type can refer to it. Now, how do you capture? By simply enumerating things that you want within the, within the capture list. That's how you capture. This is a simple capture by copy. That's how it's known. You enumerate what you want to use within your lambda. And it has an effect on the closure type. Your closure type will get a private member variable of the same type as your original variable, and it will be initialized uh, with direct initialization. There is no constructor involved whatsoever. There is not even a constructor generated. It will be directly initialized with the value of your original variable. And now it's obvious you can use it within your closure type, so your lambda can use the K. There are other types of captures. We saw a simple capture, but the most popular ones are actually capture defaults like that one that you already saw, saw on the second slide of this presentation, a capture default by copy. Generally speaking, it means copy everything that's needed into my lambda or into my closure type so I can use it. And in this case, both N and A, N and K will be copied uh, implicitly into the lambda or into the closure type, whichever you prefer. There is a capture default by reference, and that's a tricky one or not a tricky one, depends how you look at it. Uh, it simply means form references from within my closure type or from within my lambda to externally defined variables. You only form references. You might actually generate member references in your closure type. You might not, depending on how the compiler optimizes things, but it's by reference. Now, simple captures we've already seen. This is, simple, this is a simple capture by copy. A variable is copied into the lambda. Uh, in this case, only one of them, so this code won't even compile because k cannot be referred from within the lambda expression. And of course, you can also mix those. So you can specify that some of variables I would like to, for example, have to capture by reference, like k in this case, and everything else should be copied. That's the mix of a capture default with a simple capture. Uh, so far, so good. Are there other captures? Yes, there are. There are generalized captures, known also as init captures, that were introduced in C++14 to introduce a couple of problems. And they come in so many diff different flavors that it's impossible to fit them, I think, uh, into one slide or even into ten slides. Uh, but the general gist is, is that you introduce a new variable into your lambda. Like in this case, in the first case that's highlighted there for the lambda L1, a new variable M of reference type is introduced into the lambda and it will refer to the original variable answer. So you can now refer to answer, which is outside of the scope of your lambda, through a reference named M. Uh, another way to use init captures is actually to kind of automatically create new variables out of thin air. So you introduce a new name, like in this case, it's again an M name, an M variable that's referable from within your lambda, and it's initialized with the value of the, uh, that the function returns, that you call in the init capture. Uh, so those are the init captures. Those are the simple captures, the capture default, and the init captures. But there is one more important thing that we need to talk about and that the function call operator that's generated for your closure type. This is the last of the basic things that we have to cover that we are sure that we're on the same page. Look at this one, and it's again a recurring example. There is a function with two variables defined in it, a string variable and an integer variable. Now, the idea behind the lambda is that it concatenates the string with the stringified representation of the integer, but the integer is wrong. It's 43, and it should be 42. So you have to decrement it, and that's what the lambda does. 
the lambda captures string by reference and the k by value. The reason being quite simple, strings are expensive to copy, so you don't want to copy them, right? You form a reference to a string, and we are good to go. Now, one of the first surprises everybody who works with lambdas sees is that one. If you try to compile such a piece of code, you are going to get a compile compilation error that you are trying to modify a variable which is a read-only variable. It's a const variable. Why is it a const variable? Well, the hint is in the function call operator. The function call operator that you generate in your closure type is const qualified by default. It's a constant member function. And a constant member function cannot modify a member of the object, right? It's impossible. It's totally forbidden. You cannot do it. We have an illegal mutation here. And that's actually what the compiler was trying to tell us. There are two ways out of this situation. You can either capture k by reference. That's possible. That would work, right? If you have a reference in your class, you can modify the referent if the reference is not constant. And this is not a constant reference. So that's totally allowed. Uh, the other way, which is something that's commonly done, is basically dropping the const qualifier. And you drop the const qualifier, so you remove that one, by saying that the lambda itself is mutable. This is different from the normal way things work in C++. In C++, by default, functions, member functions, are non-constant. Lambdas are constant by default. You have to tell that you don't want to have the constantness. OK, so far, so good. What about this one? The same lambda expression. It's a mutable lambda expression. We capture the string by reference. We capture the k by copy. We form a copy within the lambda of k. But the original k variable is constant. It's a normal local variable with automatic storage duration, and it's constant. Will it compile? who's for it will compile. Thank you. I also thought so. It won't compile. It won't compile, and this is a problem. This is something that surprises a lot of people. Like I was surprised the first time I saw it. And it gives us an important lesson. Before you even start working with lambdas, please get familiar with the type deduction rules for captures, because they are different than for any other variables, any other scenarios that occur in C++. In this case, or not in this case, what we got was actually the last example. But before we go there, let's talk about those rules. You can capture by reference, and that's easy. When you capture by reference, so when you form a reference from your lambda to an external object, everything, everything is clean and easy. You don't drop any CV qualifiers. It's impossible. If the object was constant and you form a reference to it, well, you just formed a reference to a constant object. You cannot modify it. Now, with captures by copy, things are different. You can either have an init capture or a simple capture. And the init capture works quite intuitively. It basically works as if you defined a new variable with an automatically deduced type, with using the placeholder type auto. In this scenario, it's quite obvious. The CV of whatever your init was is dropped. Your var is not going to inherit the CV qualifiers. It's impossible, right? It would be crazy if it did. But if you use a simple capture, or for the matter of fact, a capture default, the CV qualifier qualifiers are preserved. They kind of tag along together into your lambda. And that's strange. And this is exactly what happens in this case. When there was a const variable, a local const variable, and we captured it using the simple captured, the CV qualifier wasn't dropped we got a const member variable. This is a trap, and that's a trap that some people fall into. Now, can you get rid of it, of the const qualifier? Yes, you can. And the hint was already on the previous slide. When you use an init capture, the CV will be dropped. So just use the init capture, and the constantness will be gone. A small distinction, 
but makes a lot of difference. What's next? What about if I want to do something different? If my original variable wasn't constant and I want to make it constant within the lambda for whatever the reasons are, is it possible? Now, sadly, I can already give you an answer. It's not. It doesn't work this way. Whatever you throw at the compiler, whatever you try to make this k into the constant k within your closure type, it's not going to work. You can try everything. I tried a couple of things. The list is not exhaustive. There are more things you can come up with. This doesn't work, for example. There were a couple of proposals which propose this kind of syntax. It doesn't work. It's not there. You cannot do it. You cannot qualify a capture, an init capture. You also cannot use a cast, something that Nico was talking about. Uh, because in an init capture, the, constant, the constness is dropped. So it's not going to work. The only actually thing that you can do is a workaround. And it's an ugly workaround, but it works across the board for all the compilers. You have to create a const copy of your original variable and capture it using a simple capture. And then you are going to get also a const member variable. Now, things work different for references. For references, if you capture by reference, you cannot drop a const qualifier. I mean, you can, but that's ugly and you shouldn't do it, right? You can use, of course, the const cast to const away the constness, but you shouldn't do it. But you can easily add constness for reference captures. And the way it's done is, again, with an init capture. Imagine you have a string, like in this case, there is a string, and you really don't want to capture it by copy. You want to capture it by reference and you want it to be a constant reference. That's easily done. That's easily done. You can use an init capture for it. Now, it's quite obvious. You form a reference to a constant object using a cast in between, but your reference will be to a constant object, so you won't be able to modify through this reference. Now, so far, so good, right? Those are the basics. Those are the basics. This is how capture works. This is how init capture, how simple capture, and capture default works. Then you might ask, what next? The, the next step is to learn when you need to capture and when you need not to capture. Because there are times when you not, don't have to capture or when you cannot capture. So learn when to capture. A prime example is that one. We have a function, it's a main function that defines an integer within it, an integer answer with a value of 42, and it's used in a lambda expression. And the lambda expression is quite simple. The lambda expression, actually the only thing that the lambda expression does, it uses the value of answer. It doesn't do anything else. And it uses it to do some calculations, right? It also passes it to a function, again by value. Do you need to capture this one? Who would capture it? Anybody? Some people would capture it. I would also capture it. I, I would maybe write something like this, a capture default, and actually it would work. The problem is it's totally not needed. You also can skip a capture here. If you skip the capture, the code will still work. The capture is in fact not needed. The reason is quite simple. Lambdas are allowed to read the values of constant integral object, among other things, but this is the prime example. They can read, but only the values and nothing else. So is there is a difference whether you capture or not, you might ask. Yes, there is. Because when you use the capture default, some compilers will capture the variable totally unnecessarily. Uh, one of the compilers that does it is MSVC. Nothing, it's not to bash the MSVC, by the way. Uh, and you will see in a moment why not. It captures it, and when it captures it, it increases the size of the lambda. It even gets worse if you use a simple capture. So if you capture answer explicitly, then all the compilers will capture it, uh, and, and that's exactly what you will get. An increase in the size of the lambda, totally unnecessary. Now, the situation does change if you not only read the value of the variable, but do something else with it, either directly or indirectly. Like in this case, I changed the signature of the square function. Now the square takes 
a not a value, by a reference, which basically means that your Lambda indirectly needs to read the value, uh, the address of answer. In such a case, you need a capture. There is no way out of it. You have to capture it. Okay, so far so good. What else doesn't need to be captured? Well, according to the standard, lambdas can read also the values of const expert objects or const expert variables if they don't have any mutable members. And uh, if you look at this code, actually kind of both should work. Both the one with the capture, the lambda with the capture, and the lambda without the capture. Because we capture a const expert variable, and we only need the value of this string view, nothing else. We never mutate it, we never take an address of it, nothing like this. Now, the first one works across the board. The second one works only on the MSVC. And it has, of course, consequences. It increases the size if the capture is needed. The size of the lambda is increased to 16 bytes on most of the systems. We need the pointer and the size, right? So it has consequences. So MSVC wins here. When I did this slide, I cheated a little because I said that the object, object cannot have any mutable members. A string view does. You can mutate a string view. Uh, there are two functions that mutate it. So I even wrote my own implementation of a string view, and it still only worked on MSVC, one that doesn't mutate and doesn't allow any mutation of the members. Uh, I must say that GCC is sometimes able to not capture such variables under certain scenarios, but why and when, it's still like dark magic to me. Sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. So that's const expert, and that's basically integral variables. Uh, is there anything else we don't need to capture? Yes, there is. There is one big elephant that you don't need to capture, and those are any object with static storage duration. And when I mean static storage duration, I refer basically to any kind of a global object that lives in a namespace scope or any object qualified with the keyword static. Uh, those are objects with static storage duration. They are never captured, and you cannot capture them. And for this one, let's go back to our original example, right? This is the one that I showed on the second slide of my talk, where I had a function that added a record to some database using the automatically generated key, and it was returning a lambda expression that could retrieve back the record. And I said, it's a lifetime issue. It's partially a lifetime issue. It's mostly about doing unnecessary work. Why is that? We use a capture default here, right? So you could say, well, I am safe. I capture everything that I need. There is nothing wrong that can go wrong with this code. But surprisingly, there is something wrong that go can go with this code. This code can possibly crash your program. The reason is under the hood. It's hidden in plain view in a way. When you see a lambda like this that uses a capture default, you should look what variables are used within this lambda. Here it's a DB context and the key. Then look where those variables are. You can easily identify what the key is, so you can be sure it's being copied. But what is this DB context? Where does it come from? And if you don't know what the DB context is, then what is copied into your lambda? Is the DB context really copied there or not? Now, as a matter of fact, the DB context in this case is a member with static storage duration. It's a variable with static storage duration. It just lives in a global scope. Such objects cannot be copied into the lambda, cannot be captured by reference into the lambda. They are not captured. If you don't believe me, you can try doing it explicitly. You can try to capture the DB context by just using a simple capture, and every single compiler will tell you it cannot be done and it will tell you in very harsh words by just stopping the compilation process and producing an error telling you that an object with a static storage duration cannot be copied or cannot be captured. So if we don't capture the DB context, what do we capture? Only the key. The DB context is an external object with static storage duration. Now, why is it bad? It's bad because obviously all the objects that are global variables are bad. 
And in this case, the badness seems to be in the fact that somebody on some other thread modified the DB context that you refer to from within your Lambda. Totally ruining, ruining your retrieval later using this DB context. Is there a solution to it? Well, there is a solution. The solution is if there is an object with static storage duration and you depend on its state in your Lambda, copy it. There is one way to copy such an object and it is by using the init captures. It is fully allowed to do it. You can make a full copy of something like this and store it into your Lambda. Do it, it will save you some trouble if you are in a situation that you have to refer to a global object. How did we come here? How did we come actually to this situation that we were capturing things unknowingly or actually we weren't capturing things unknowingly? We came to this situation by using a capture default, right? There is a capture default there. And it gives you this illusion that everything will go right, that I will, everything will go fine because you are safe. It, you cannot get any safer than this. But this is only an illusion. And contrary to what the title of this talk tells you, never capture everything, or do not capture everything, or to put it in other words, do not use capture defaults. They are tricky and they will hide complexity and they will hide traps from you. Unless you, of course, are absolutely sure that you know what you are doing. Why not? Besides the examples that I showed, look at this one. It's again the same function. We don't change the function. The function stayed exactly the same. Now, the only difference is that the DB context now is not an object, external object with a static storage duration. It is now a member object of the KV proxy. So far, so good. We can use it from within a member function, so we can use it inside the Lambda, and we have a capture default. Now, the question that you should ask yourself is the same as always when you see a capture default and we encounter an error. What is really captured there? Is it like the key? Is it the KV proxy? Is it the DB context? what is captured there. Or maybe it's some combination of all of those, right? Now, in this case, the last answer is correct. It's a combination of some of those above. And in fact, two objects are captured, the key and the current KV proxy object. But there is a surprise awaiting. Our capture that we saw before, the capture default, is actually equivalent to that one. So with two simple captures of key and the current object, this. The surprise is that the key is captured by value, but the current object, this, is captured by reference. It's not captured by value. You only refer to it through a reference. Is it dangerous? Yes. It might potentially create a lifetime issue, uh, like in a very simple scenario where you have a function that creates a local KV proxy and directly uses it to add a record and return the lambda that this function, the add record function, returns. In such a case, you are up for a crash during the runtime, of course. Uh, why? Very simply. When you create, when you call this function, a local proxy is created and it dies actually at the moment uh, where this semicolon here ends. And this results in a runtime error because your lambda that you got back refers to an object that doesn't exist anymore. Now, I'm not saying that there is no solution to it. There is. Of course there is a solution. Instead of capturing by reference, you can capture by copy. That's how you capture the current object by copy. It's doable. Do it. Yes. But the devil is in the details. It's not as easy as it seems. Look at those two functions, or two actually pieces of functions where we return a lambda. One captures by reference, Y captures by copy. So one lambda only has a reference to the current object. The other one has a full copy of the current object. Now, the DB context that the Lambda referred to 
is not a local variable. It's a member variable of the context that we captured. In fact, we can refer to this directly. We can use the keyword this to signify this fact that the, B that the DB context is not a local variable. It will work. It will compile. But it creates all kinds of problems and issues that you, are not that you might not be aware of. If you ever capture this current object, approach it with caution, because it can bite you back. And to support my statement, I want to come back to very simple scenarios. We have two structures, exactly the same structures. They only have one data member, an integral data member cannot be simpler. And both of them do have a function that returns a lambda. And let's keep the problem with the lifetime on the left-hand side. I know there is a lifetime issue there. We capture by reference, right? That's possibly a problem. Ignore it for now. Because we actually refer to the surrounding object or to its copy, in both cases we can refer, instead of directly to n, we can refer indirectly to n using the pointer this and the member of operator, and it will still work. But this is a kind of magic. This, which we are so used to, this that always refers to the current object in any other context, now can refer to different things. It's like a magic disk. Now, to add to it, the lambda on the left-hand side does compile, and the code on the left-hand side compiles. The one on the right-hand side doesn't. And, I mean, when you look into it, it's quite obvious why it doesn't. The one on the left-hand side captures by reference. So you form a reference inside your closure type to an external object. You still have a const member, a const member function, the function call operator, and obviously it can modify a referent that's fully allowed, that's a legal mutation. And we do modify a referent or a member of the referent right here. Now, in the second case, it won't work because we capture a full object by copy. We have a copy of it inside. And you cannot modify an object that's your member from a const member function. That's not how things work in C++. So this is not going to work. You can, of course, solve this problem quite easily by adding the keyword mutable, and things will start to work. We'll drop the const qualifier, and it will compile. But there is an important detail here. Depending on how you capture this, that this pointer within your lambda and only within your lambda means different things. And I know it's the same actually for simple variables with automatic storage duration, whether you capture by reference or by copy. You have different semantics. But this is dangerous because we are so used to the fact that this always points to the current object. It gets worse. At least in my opinion, it gets worse. There are prime four methods of capturing the current object in C++. You can either use one of the capture defaults, or you can capture the current object using the this or the asterisk this. Now, this is not how you normally would capture by reference and by copy. Or let's say this is exactly how you would capture by copy, but not by reference. For any other variable, you would have to specify a simple capture in a totally different form. You would have to be explicit about that you capture by reference. Not here. There is something even worse lurking, and that's this. A default capture, a capture default by copy, captures automatic variables with automatic storage duration differently than the current object. Every single variable is captured by copy besides the current object. This is copied by reference. It's actually so bad uh, that it was deprecated in C++20. So the idea is to remove it fully later in a language. That's a trap. And as I said, doesn't matter how you capture and what you capture, you always refer to either the copy of the enclosing object or the object itself through the keyword this. And that's 
craziness. And it will be even more crazy once the C23 gets really properly implemented by and supported by all the compilers, because lambdas then will start referring to themselves using the explicit object pointer that's been added with a paper deducing this to C23. So you will have two different current objects within a lambda. Uh, is there a solution for it? Yes, there is a solution to every problem, of course. And I think the cor correct solution to this problem is to use init captures when capturing this. We have init captures. They were introduced for a purpose. They were introduced to make better code and safer code. Look at this code. It's exactly the same as before. We capture by reference, we capture by copy, but now we do it explicitly using the init captures. It's readable. Everybody knows what you captured, how you captured, and that one is a reference and that the other one is a full object that you copied into your lambda. So it's quite obvious why the mutable is needed there, right? Because you mutate your object. Now, I'm going to go even a step further and say that not only you might use this, but in some scenarios you might go a step further. It very often happens that your objects are big, but your lambdas refer only to a part of it. If you capture by reference, it doesn't matter. By why copy everything into your lambda? Do cherry pick what you need if you can cherry pick. If there is a lot of data like this, do consider capturing only things that you need. That's easily done, again, using an init capture. This is the only way to capture a member of the current object using the init capture. Otherwise, it's not allowed. Do it, and your lambdas will thank you for it. They will be lighter, take less, less space, and become more readable. Now, you cannot always do it. I would be lying if I said that you can always do it. There are scenarios when it cannot be done. And a prime example of such scenarios where you cannot cherry pick a variable besides, of course, when you need all the member variables for the functionality, is when your lambda calls some functions of, your, of the class where it resides in. Like in this case, I don't have access anymore to the end directly. Instead, I use two functions. Both of the member functions, one does modify, one doesn't modify the member variables. One is const, one is non-const. Now, in fact, I could rewrite this code into this one, and it would still compile, so I need a capture. And I have two options. I either capture it by reference or, or by copy. Uh, and if I were to follow my own advice, actually, it would be even better if I did it explicitly, like this. Right? So I would say with an init capture that I'm capturing by copy. This code doesn't suffer from problems. I mean, part of this code doesn't suffer from problems. Uh, and the other part does. Uh, now, the code on the right-hand side does compile, and the code on the left-hand side doesn't. And, as always, it has some, something to do with const propagation and const correctness. Uh, that's something that protects us, but that's also something that we need to be aware of. Notice that both functions make lambda are constant member functions, which means that this pointer within those functions is a pointer to a constant, right? Now, when you use a simple capture, like on the left-hand side, this constness is propagated. So what you do is you capture a copy of a constant object, and this is also a constant object. When you use an init capture, uh, well, this is not the case. The constness is dropped, and you can use it. With references, of course, it works a bit different. Neither of those pieces of code will compile. Uh, the reason is, when you capture by reference, whatever means you use, the constness is not dropped. You form a reference to a constant object, and, uh, and that's the end of the story. And the only solution is actually to drop the const qualifier from the make lambda function. Be aware of it, because it really sometimes gets you those ugly errors that you will never understand. Const propagation also works when you capture the current object, this. Now, 
if I were to follow my own advice that I was giving you about how to capture and how to write proper captures for the current object, I actually should write a piece of code like this, right? In my original example when I had the key value proxy. I shouldn't be capturing like the whole object. Uh, I shouldn't be capturing by reference, most likely because it can potentially create lifetime issues. I should be actually cherry picking what I want to capture. So make a copy of the DB context uh, into my Lambda. And this will work fine most of the time, uh, except what it won't. A common error, right? Everybody has seen something like this once a day at least. Something cannot be copied because it has an explicitly or implicitly deleted copy constructor and the copy assignment operator. It's a move-only object. Is the solution to this problem? Yes, there is. Of course, that's actually prime reason for introducing the init captures. Init captures in lambdas were introduced to support move-only objects. So you could move something into your lambda that cannot be copied. Hooray, we can move the DB context into the lambda. But this creates another issue, and this issue is an ugly one. Sometimes our lambdas will be now perfect, sometimes they won't be. In the, co in the code that's at the top of the screen here, it works perfectly. You can move the whole proxy or a part of it into your lambda as a part of the add record function and nobody will suffer from it, right? This proxy is about to die anyway. It's just falling out of context and out of scope. You can safely move a part of it into the Lambda. Now, when you plan to reuse your proxy, this is not the case. Like when your proxy has to leave and support multiple additions, for example, using the DB context, and if you just moved your DB context in the first call to the add record, well, this is done. This is like the ugliest error you can imagine, hard to track, how to understand how to debug because something happened, your code compiles, and you might get an error you might not depending on, on what kind of code you have. And again, as with any problem, there is usually a, a solution. It's not an easy solution, but it sometimes happens. As I said at the very beginning of this talk, capturing is mostly about lifetime or avoiding lifetime disasters. Uh, in complex scenarios. That's one of the reasons why you would ever capture. In this case, you can support different lifetime requirements by writing different, by using different captures or by using different capture modes. This is absolutely possible and this is what you should do. How do you do it? Well, that's the function we have, right? That's the function we have and we know it works in certain scenarios. It works when we are absolutely sure that we can actually steal from the proxy. We can steal its part of the whole proxy if we want. That's the function we would also like to have. This is for the scenarios when we want the key KV proxy to stay alive and functional. Can you have those two overloads? Yes, you can. Of course you can. That's a less known feature of C++ 11. I think 11. But since then, instead of using cons qualifiers, instead of cons qualifying your member functions, you can ref qualify them. You can add a reference qualifier at the end of the argument list or parameter list. And there are many of them. There are actually four of them. One of them is barely usable. But those two will suffice for this example. The first one will the R value qualifier or the R value reference qualifier basically tells you that this overload of the add record should be called only when the KV proxy is at the end of the lifetime. When it's what we call an ex expiring object, like it's almost dead. The other one, the L value reference qualified, will be called when your KV, KV proxy is an L value, which is a common case, right? You have a named object, it's not a temporary, it's not at the end of the lifetime, it's a named object, named variable, it's an L value. For those cases, this one will be called. When you do something like this, when you support different lifetime requirements by using different overloads and using different capture modes, the code will work. It will work almost out of the box for most of the scenarios, 
like it will work out of the box in case of the L values, the bottom part of the screen. It won't really work out of the box for the top part of the screen because you have to instruct the compiler that actually the proxy is about to die, and you will do it, as always, by using the std move. This casts the proxy to the R value, and this signifies the fact that the proxy is at the end of the lifetime, and you can safely grab from it, and the correct overload will be picked. And I must say that there is a lot more that I could be talking about lambdas, but the time is ticking, uh, and I can actually only focus on one topic more, I think. And that's the three dots. The three dots, that's the fun feature of lambda captures. Why would you ever need three dots in your code? Well, imagine a scenario like this. You have a perfectly working code, a key value proxy that is a proxy to some database, and it supports adding and retrieving records. Now, but the changes are coming, and instead of using the, your old good database context, there are now many other databases that you need to support. So you will template your whole structure. It will become a class template. So far, so good. Now, another issue will arise sooner or later. Different databases use different kind of updates or need different parameters when you add something to it or where you retrieve something from it. Like one might use a storage policy additionally to the key. Uh, one might use also some authentication token. Why not? Uh, the possibilities are countless. And notice in that in all those cases, you actually need to capture all those additional parameters because they are needed when you later on retrieve from the database. Now you have two options here. Either you specialize your class template for every single scenario, but that's craziness, or you add countless overloads, uh, but that's also craziness, uh, or use parameter packs. So the three dots to store multiple, to capture multiple objects in generic code. What are parameter packs? For the uninitiated, parameter packs are a feature that allows you to define function templates that can potentially take multiple arguments or non-arguments at all. So imagine a scenario like this, when you have a function, take many arguments, and the only job that this function is doing is calling another function the consume function, and there are multiple overloads for the consume, and you would like to support all those scenarios. Now, you might write also like three overloads for take many arguments, but that's silly. Instead, what you are going to do is introduce a parameter pack. That's how you do it. That basically defines a function template that can take from zero to multiple arguments of some types, all of them by const reference. That's why the three dots. The three dots is a parameter pack. Now, that's capturing. That's how we define the signature. And later on, when you do for where it's somewhere, where you reuse this parameter pack, you also have to expand it, again, by using the three dots. Now, this feature, parameter packs, has been there from C++ 11, and it works great. When you use it, all the scenarios will work. You can call take many arguments with whatever you want. This feature also works for lambdas. Lambdas can capture argument packs or parameter packs. Sorry. How is it done? Well, first of all, we need to change the at record signature because we have to somehow introduce the parameter pack. So the signature will change to possibly allow multiple arguments of unknown types. That's the parameter pack, right? Now, this will be also used when you update the database store because obviously you need to forward those arguments, whatever their type is. This is only const reference, but whatever the type is it used. And last but not least, you will have to capture them. That's how you capture. The name of the parameter pack with three dots is a capture, and then within the lambda, you expand. This is a unique feature of lambdas. There is no other way in C++ to create an object or a class type and saying that it's going to have some data members, but I don't know upfront how many. You can only work around this problem by using a tuple or building in a tuple into your class type. 
Lambdas don't need a tuple to support it. Lambdas just can capture unknown number of arguments, the unknown number of variables, and they will create the data members for it. So far, so good, but there is a small problem there. Uh, with different databases, uh, when I work with them, and I you know, add a record, I sometimes want to reuse some object that I pass to my add record function, like maybe there is a policy which never changes, so I want to keep it around and pass it by a reference, uh, and some I only use once, like the authentication token is generated for a short use time, and basically I have to use the same authentication token to retrieve my data which I use for storing the data. So it's like something that I would like to move. I don't want to keep it around, I want to move it into the add record function, and later on I want to move it into the lambda. But now we capture everything by const, or actually we pass everything by const reference, which means that we also capture by copy. Can you move things, uh, and can you actually move some things and don't move some other things? Yes, you can. In C++ 20, this feature has been added, and from now on, you can capture parameter packs using also init captures. What does it mean for our code? Well, it means that instead of capturing by const reference, as on the previous slide, you can capture by forwarding reference, or as some people prefer to say, by the universal reference. This has this magic under the hood that it correctly forwards the value category of your argument. So whether you pass an R value reference or a value or an L value reference, the value category will be preserved. What's next? The capture comes next, right? We need to also capture it correctly and we do it with init captures and pack expansion and forwarding. This is supported since three years. You can use it, and it will correctly work. What can be moved will be moved into your Lambda. What cannot be and should be copied will be copied. This is perfect forwarding, right? That's how it works for other scenarios, and that's also how it works for Lambdas. And when you do something like this, magically, the policy will be copied and the authentication token will be moved into your Lambda and everything will work just as you would expect. Now, that's almost the end of this talk. We covered a lot. We covered the type deduction rules for Lambdas. We covered different ways of capturing. We talked extensively about capturing this and the dangers of it. We talked about lifetime issues and other issues associated with capturing this. And last but not least, we talk about how to use init captures to move or forward things or even the lots of things together into your Lambda and why it makes sense. I said in the beginning that capturing is mostly about lifetime. Uh, but it's not only about lifetime. It's also about writing generic code, like in this case. And first and foremost, because those are Lambdas, it's also about having fun. Lambda some fun, have fun with them. And this is really the end of this talk. Thank you very much for listening. Yes. I'm on time, uh, which means that if somebody wants to ask a question, this question is very well, much welcome. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. You said at some point, never capture everything, right? Yeah. And I tend to totally agree with never capture everything by value. But I seem to be fine with capturing everything by reference because I've never seen an unexpected behavior with that. Like capturing everything by value, as you uh, as you shown as the problem with capturing members and everything, and suddenly they became actual references. But that doesn't seem to happen with when you capture by reference. If you capture everything by reference, you need to be careful about the lifetime of what you capture, no matter what. So do you have an opinion uh, on capturing yes. everything by value, essentially? Uh, I fully agree with you. If you capture by reference and you know what you're doing, you usually don't expect any problems. Especially if you're sure that all your objects are within the lifetime, you won't have any problems. And that's a very common thing to do, right? especially if you write a function and you never return anything from this function, you just 
pass the lambda around to some other functions within this, within this one. It's absolutely correct, but it would totally ruin my point there, so I didn't include there. So I'll Forget the question then, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks again. Uh, it seems like nobody's asking anything else. Uh, thanks a lot and see you around. Have a fun conference then. <laughs>